please welcome Mark Beckler. It's very hard to follow somebody with that much energy. <laughs> so first, let me thank you for being here tonight. I have the privilege of traveling all over the country, giving speeches all over the country, working with grassroots activists all over the country, and it is truly a privilege. It's not for me about giving speeches, because I really just am a grassroots activist. My story in politics begins about eight years ago with the advent of the Tea Party movement. A lot of you were sitting in the same place I was, frustrated, angry, occasionally hurling a shoe at the television, and then this Tea Party thing happened. Rick Santelli on CNBC got on national television and in a spontaneous rant basically said that the bailout of American mortgages was un-American. I remember the first time I saw it, he said it was un-American, he said it was outrageous, he said if, if we could just pay people for doing the wrong thing, then if we paid out trillions, maybe everybody would just be rich and everything would be fine. And he was outraged and the anchors that were back in the studio, he was reporting from the Chicago Mercantile, the anchors back in the studio laughed at Santelli when he did this. And he got angry. And he said, you're laughing at me, but I'm speaking the truth. And the traders on the floor behind him applauded. And they mocked the traders and said, oh, these guys are just doing whatever you say. And Santelli got angry with them. And he said, these are great American people who work hard for a living. These are the kind of people I'm talking about. And he talked about the un-Americanism of awarding people benefits for doing the wrong things. Taking money from hardworking taxpayers who could pay their mortgages, who didn't get in too deep, who were being responsible, and making them pay the debts of others. I saw that, somebody sent me a clip of that, and I remember sitting at my desk, I'm an attorney, I was uh, at practice from home, I was sitting at home at my desk, and I remember pounding on my desk and saying, yeah, I mean, that's what I think. I feel exactly like this guy. And unbelievably, it wasn't Fox News, right? So that made it something different and something special. It was a moment that I think will be remembered in American history. That spread like wildfire on the internet. Rush Limbaugh picked up the clip and started playing it. And suddenly there was a moment. There was a brush fire that had been lit across the land. And all these people started talking about the idea of holding a tea party. This goes back to uh, April, sorry, originally February, sorry, of 2009. Santelli does his rant on the 19th. On the 20th, about 20 people get together on a conference call organized through Twitter to talk about what should we do about this. I wasn't on the call a bunch of the early adopters in the Tea Party movement were, and they decided that they should hold a Tea Party. Now, Santelli had suggested the idea of a Tea Party. He had said that he was going to hold it on the shores of the lake there in Chicago. He called for it on July 4th, a long ways in the future. But these folks felt like something was happening. It's really important in politics when a moment happens that you take advantage of that moment. And luckily, there were people who were smart enough to sense it, just grassroots activists, not professional political folks. And they decided in that moment to hold a Tea Party protest, when nobody knew what it meant, a week later, all across the country. So literally, this is the very first Tea Party protest. Now, most people don't know about this protest, actually. It took place February 27, 2009. I heard about the idea on the 21st. I did the appropriate thing for a guy who's been married for a very long time. I asked my wife's per uh, permission to participate. <laughs> She's from Boston. She liked the idea of a Tea Party. So we held our event down in Sacramento at the state capitol. Meanwhile, around the country, 34 other people held these protests around the country. And California, as you know, is a lot like New York. It's not exactly a red state. So we went down to the state capitol not knowing what would happen. And it's my first political event ever. Literally, I'd never been involved in politics at all. And 150 people ultimately showed up at that event. And I went and I talked to all of them. One, because it just made me feel good to know that I was not the only crazy person in California, right? There are at least 149 others, and two, because I just wanted to know why. I knew why I was there. I was there because I didn't know what else to do. It seemed like no matter who I voted for, no matter who was in office, Washington, D.C. got bigger and the citizen got smaller. And I felt cut off from the system, almost disenfranchised, even though I voted. And so I wanted to know if other people felt the way I did. And as I walked around the people there and I talked to every single one, I met people of every race, we people, we had a big fight going on in the marriage and family fight. There were gay rights activists out there, there were marriage and family folks. There were conservatives and liberals out there. And everybody was just frustrated and everybody said the same thing that I was saying, don't know exactly why I'm here, except for I don't know what else to do. 
this sense of despair and yet hope in that moment that this fire had been lit. So I had a great time. It was just fun. People honked at us. My folks were there. My kid, young kids were there. They were 10 and 13 at the time. We carried signs. I mean, things that conservatives don't normally do is pretty wild for us, right? Really stepping out. We almost got arrested, which was really exciting. We went home afterwards, and when we got home, I started to network all over California, just looking at people's Facebook pages and trying to figure out who else did this. And I just started calling people and talking to them. I just liked people, and I just wanted to know if they had as much fun as we did. And when I started calling around, I met a lot of great people who had had just as much fun as we did, different experiences in different places. And then I started getting calls from the media, because apparently I had become the California Tea Party coordinator. Right? I had a title. And nobody gave me that title. There was no organization. It's just that I was the guy making the phone calls. So when the reporters started calling around and saying, well, who knows about this, people started saying, well, you should call this guy Mark Meckler. So I start getting all this attention. So I start calling around the country to find out who else in the country has done this. That's how we know, ultimately, 35 events, about 39,000 people came out, started networking all over the country. And what came out of that was a core group of five or six of us decided once was not enough. We didn't know what it meant, like what was exactly happening, what the Tea Party exactly was, but we knew we needed to continue it. So we decided to hold the Tea Party that most people know about, the big protest, which was April 15, 2009. And we figured, like, if we could get 39,000 people to come out on seven days' notice, if we could get 35 of these events around the country, maybe we could just, to use a term, have the audacity of hope that we could get 70 of them we had five or six weeks notice. So we chose April 15, 2009. Look, people are mad on tax day already. It seemed like a good day. So we chose that day. We put up a website, which was taxdayteaparty.com. None of us knew anything about what we were doing. Contrary to popular urban myth, the Koch brothers had nothing to do with it. I'm still waiting for the check. It is a long time coming at this point. If any of you know them, just let them know I'm waiting for it. And we set up this website. I want you to understand how truly naive we were and that how truly grassroots this was. I am, by training, an internet privacy attorney. That's what I was practicing at home. I put my home phone number on the website. <laughs> I didn't know what was about to happen. What happened was it exploded. Within the first day, there were 35 tea parties listed on that website. And by the second day, it was 70. And then it was 100 and 150 and 200, and then people from New York were calling me at 3 in the morning, not realizing it was California, and, and they wanted to talk about the Tea Party they had listed on the website, and it just exploded. And then the most miraculous thing happened, which was in my office, we got a call from Neil Cavuto's producer, which I was absolutely certain was a crank phone call, because why would Neil Cavuto call us? And luckily my wife took it more seriously, called him up, and Neil wanted to come to California to cover the protests. And Sean Hannity had called our Atlanta organizers, and he wanted to go to Atlanta, and Greta Van Susteren was going to go to D.C., and you had Glenn Beck somehow fittingly wanted to go to the Alamo, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that caused the thing, as you can imagine, to go crazy, because Fox did something that no other network was doing, which is they covered it as news. And it was indeed news. There was an uprising taking place across America. The other networks weren't covering it, and Fox was willing to cover it. The short version of a long story is it turned my life completely upside down. We ultimately had 20,000 people show up in Sacramento. It was the largest protest in the history of the California State Capitol. They closed the streets for several blocks around the Capitol. It was a completely amazing experience. And the same thing happened all over the country. In Atlanta, they had 25,000 people. In D.C., I think they had 8,000 people. The most amazing thing to me were in small towns, or five or six or seven thousand people lived, they had fifteen hundred or two thousand people come out all across the country. And when we calculated it, we called around, we tried to double verify the attendees at every event, we came up with a number of about 1.2 million people came out on that day in April of 2009. Now that's extraordinary. Did any of you go to the protests in New York? Is there anybody here that was? Thank you guys for coming out. You guys give yourselves a hand. You guys have been early up. So this amazing thing happens in America, and the Tea Party movement breaks out. And for me personally, what happens is it turns my life completely upside down. The media is calling, activists are calling from all over the country, what's next, what's next, what do we do? And we found the Tea Party patriots because we didn't know what else to do. Literally, again, remember, just grassroots activists, no idea what's going on. We fund the group or found the group, fund the group out of our own pockets because we don't know anything about raising money. And literally, over the next year and a half, 
I stopped practicing law, and I spend every penny that I've ever saved in my entire life. And luckily, I have a very supportive and patriotic wife. And my co-founders do the same. We burn through all of our money because we literally don't even know to ask for money. This is how naive we are. And ultimately, I believe that there's providential intervention. A big donor steps forward when I speak at an event and offers us enough money to keep going. We literally got to the point of the verge of bankruptcy. I remember one of the most important conversations of my life, and if you've been married long enough, you've had these conversations with your husband or wife laying in bed one night and wondering how you're gonna pay the bills, right? We've all been through rough times, and I remember saying to my wife that, you know, I don't know how we're gonna keep going with this tea party thing because I'm not practicing law and we're not making any money. And she said, we should spend the kids' college money. <laughs> That's pretty extraordinary, right? For a, women are, they are uh, security conscious, kid conscious. And she said, and I'll never forget it, she said that it's more important to have a country where it's worth our kids going to college than to have the money to send the kids to college. So I'm very, as you can tell, I'm a very blessed man. I'm married way up. So thank you. So you know what happens with the Tea Party in 2010 because all of you come out and work like Marsha was talking about and get involved. We elect the largest swing class in the history of Congress since 1930. It's really incredible, right? It's pretty darn exciting. I was in D.C. that night. It was really amazing. I'll never remember it. November 10th, we had this huge party. My kids are there. My family's there. It's unbelievable as we watch the returns coming in, as we watch Congress flip. All these guys come in, they all get inaugurated. It's so exciting because everything is going to change. And then, nothing changes. Literally, nothing changes. It's really important we remember this. And I, I think we don't think about this enough, and I think we let Congress off the hook. The House has the power of the purse, which means virtually nothing happens unless they spend the money on it. And what did they do with that power after 2010? Nothing. They didn't defund anything. All the stuff that they said that they were against, the illegal amnesty and everything else, they defunded nothing. They had the power to entirely defund illegal amnesty. They had the power to entirely defund Obamacare. They could have done it on their own in the House of Representatives, and they did nothing. It was pretty distressing for me as a guy who was sort of at the point of the spear of the Tea Party movement. And then I started to watch the Republican Party co-op the Tea Party. And it was a really interesting process to be on the inside of because the Republican, the party itself had no enthusiasm and all the enthusiasm was on the outside with the Tea Party movement. So the Republicans really wanted the Tea Party and amazingly the Democrats really wanted the Tea Party to be Republican. This was really important to them, right? Because in order to demonize us, they had to make sure it was all Republican. And so I watched the movement slowly get co-opted and eaten alive by the Republican Party. I watched guys go on TV and call themselves Tea Partiers and then vote in ways that this is absolutely unbelievable to me. They were not standing for the values that we stood for. They were not standing for constitutional governance, for fiscal responsibility, for free markets, right? These were the guys that we were electing, but they were not our guys when they got to Washington, D.C. So as I watched this whole thing unfold, I decided, okay, this is not the solution. This is my eighth grade civics class. I was taught you vote for the right people, and if you put enough of them in office, the right things happen, but it wasn't working. And so I stepped away. And I said, I'm not gonna, if it doesn't work, I'm not gonna do it. And I was getting asked this question over and over when I traveled around and spoke. What do we do? What do we do, right? That's a good rhetorical question to ask yourself if you're not involved in politics. But if you're like Marsha and you're standing up here, if you're like me and you're standing up here, you need to have answers. It's not right to come and lecture at a place like this and talk to people and say, I don't know, I have no idea, but I really didn't know what to do. I founded an organization called Citizens for Self-Governance and the point of founding that organization was one idea, which is that there was something missing in our system of governance that was fundamental to the system. There was, a, there was an idea that had fallen out of favor and it was very simply the idea of self-governance. Right? This idea that it's about individual responsibility, that we practice self-governance with ourselves, at home, with our families, in our community, and it come to be this generally accepted thing among Republicans and Democrats that the solutions come from the federal government. So I realized that if we could not restore this idea of self-governance into American society, that we could never be a self-governing society again, and we couldn't fix the country. I started by raising money. We gave a million dollars away to local grassroots groups to try to help the grassroots groups because the Tea Party movement hadn't done a very good job of that. 
And then I pa crossed paths with a guy by the name of Michael Ferris. Is there anybody in here that knows the name Mike Ferris? If you homeschooled your kids, then you owe Michael Ferris a debt of gratitude. If you know anybody who homeschooled their kids. In the 1970s, homeschooling your kids, by the way, was illegal in all 50 states in one form or another. It's hard to imagine that now. Fundamental right of parents to decide how their kids were educated have been taken over by the federal government. Ferris was a young attorney, decided that was wrong, and he decided to fix it, and he did. And that's why it's legal today. And Ferris came to me and he said this, Mark, are you satisfied with what you're accomplishing in politics? The answer was self-evident. It was no, I wasn't satisfied. And he said, there's a reason. Because what you're trying to do is put good people in Washington, D.C., and it does not matter how many people you put in Washington, D.C. You can have 60 good senators. You can have 70 good senators. You can have 120, 130, 150, 300 good members in the House of Representatives, and you will not get the governance you want because we have a broken structure in America. We do not have a personnel problem in Washington, D.C. We have a structure problem in Washington, D.C. And this is how he explained it to me. He said, let me explain to you some of the major structural flaws that have been introduced into our system of governance. For example, and, and Marsha mentioned this, we have the 17th Amendment. The 17th Amendment provided for the direct election of senators. You guys get to vote for your senators here in this. You may not get who you vote for, but you get to vote for your senators here in this state. Same in California. Well, it wasn't intended to be that way. The founders set it up so that the state legislatures appointed their own senators. And the people didn't have a vote. The House was the people's house, and the senators actually represented state government in Washington, D.C. That was changed with the 17th Amendment. So what did that break? I want you to think about the incentive of a senator who works for the state legislature versus the incentive of a senator who works for the people. So a senator who now works for the federal government is paid by the federal government. Are they more powerful or less powerful if there's more power in Washington, D.C.? More powerful, right? Their power is in Washington. Your senator's power is not here in New York. They don't have any power in New York. Their power is in Washington, D.C. Human beings naturally, by our nature, we accrete power to ourselves. We, we want more power. So they are now incentivized to draw power to themselves in Washington, D.C. It's just human nature. It doesn't make them bad people. The idea that the federal government should have less power and the state government should have more power is anathema to what it means to be a senator. It broke the balance. Here's another example of why the 17th Amendment broke the balance. Anybody ever hear of an unfunded mandate? It's where the federal government says, hey, New York, you're going to do this. We're going to tell you how you do it. It's going to cost you a whole bunch of money, and we're going to give you no money, and we're going to give you no input on how it gets done. That does not sound like a very good deal, does it? Right, so imagine now, your senators, by the way, vote for unfunded mandates all the time. They like them. Why do they like them? Because Washington, D.C., meaning them, get to tell you here at home what to do and how to do it and how to spend your money, your tax dollars, New York tax dollars. Right, so that's how it works. Now imagine if they work for the state legislature. Imagine a senator coming home from Washington, D.C. and going to his state legislator that he's accountable to and standing in front of that legislature and saying, I have great news. I just voted on your behalf to make you spend all kinds of money over which you have absolutely no authority, but you'll have to tax your own citizens to raise that. Right? The legislature would say, you're fired. We're going to send somebody else. The Senate was designed for a particular purpose in the United States of America. It's a really simple job. Senators were meant to say one word a lot in Washington, D.C., and that word was no. That's it. The, the federal government was going to say, we want to do this, and the Senate would say, no, you can't. That's for the states. But oh, we want to spend money on that? No, you can't. The states say you can't. We want this power? No, you can't have that. That's what the Senate was designed to do. So when we passed the 17th Amendment, we broke that down. So let me give you another example. The federal government has its hands in everything, right? They decide what, how your car should run, what kind of gasoline you put in your car. They decide about your water systems. They decide the way this building is built and what a lot of the codes are. They decide what toilets you could put in your house, right? It's outrageous. They're involved in everything. Where is it in the Constitution that it says the federal government can tell me what kind of toilet to put in my house? I've read it a lot. I can't find that. By the way, I'm just saying we're on film, right? I admit this openly. In my office in California, I built a new office. I put an illegal toilet in my office. I am a toilet rebel. I admit that on camera. Well, if Mueller investigates me, I'm in big trouble. 
So where does that power come from? Where did the federal government get that power? They got that power under the Commerce Clause. Commerce Clause in the Constitution says this, the federal government has the power to regulate interstate commerce. What is that? What does it mean now? Commerce today, if I ask you what commerce means and you were to look it up, basically it means business, right? If you think of commerce, you think of business. If you think of regulate, you think of a regulatory agency, big rule books, all kinds of regulations, right? But here's the deal, in 1787 it didn't mean anything like that. 1787, the word commerce actually meant the shipment of goods. If you had asked Daniel Webster, if you had asked Ben Franklin, they'd have told you to look in Webster's Dictionary, and then you'd have looked it up and it would have said, commerce is the shipment of goods. Regulate meant something different too. It meant to regularize, meaning to smooth out, and to make simple and easy. There's a reason for that, and it's your fault here in New York. New York and New Jersey were on the verge of a military trade war over tariffs at the time of the convention in 1787. And everybody acknowledged this is ridiculous. We have to give the federal government the power to smooth out the shipment of goods across state lines. In the 1930s, in a case called Willard v. Filburn, the Supreme Court said this, when a farmer grows wheat for his own consumption, that affects interstate commerce because he's not buying wheat on the open market. In other words, not doing business in the open market is doing business in the open market, meaning everything is subject to the Interstate Commerce Clause. The Department of Energy, the Department of Education, the Department of Commerce, the EPA, all authorized under the auspices of these Supreme Court interpretations. Now, I hear a lot of people say this to me when we talk about Convention of States. Mark, here's the deal. If they would just enforce the Constitution, if they would just follow the Constitution that we have, everything would be just fine. Anybody ever hear that? I've said it myself a lot of times. They don't pay attention to the Constitution. But here's the real deal about the Constitution. I said that to Mike Ferris when he brought me this project. And he said, which Constitution are you talking about? I thought that was a really weird question. I only know about one Constitution. He said, no, no, we have two Constitutions in America. We have the one you can visit in the National Archives under glass. It's beautiful. Everybody should see it. It's really inspiring. You guys might be carrying it around in a pocket constitution, easy to understand, compact, well-written, and I think divinely inspired. And then we have the constitution under which you and I today live. That constitution, if you want to buy it, you can only get it from the government printing office. It's called the annotated constitution. The last full printing was 2,738 pages. It contains all the cases you hate. It contains that Commerce Clause case. It contains the Obergefell marriage decision. It contains Obamacare. That is the Constitution, whether we like it or not, under which we live today. And when Congress says they're following the Constitution, genuinely, they are. Because everything they're doing is within the auspices of all those decisions made by the Supreme Court. So that leads me to a question. If we don't think it's right, if we don't like what they're doing according to that Constitution, what do we do about it? How do we fix it? Is electing people enough? Well, we've proven that, right? So you get the House, you get the Senate, and nothing changes, and now we get the President. And I think the President is doing the best he can under the circumstances. The circumstances are deep, and I mean the deep state circumstances, right? So I don't think they're ever going to fix Washington, D.C. from Washington. But we have the power to do it. And this is extraordinary and untouched. It is an unmined gem in the United States Constitution. I'm going to go way back in history to September 15, 1787. September 15, I think, is the most important day in American history, primarily because on September 15, my lovely wife was born. So I cannot forget September 15. But also, September 15, 1787, two days before the end of convention, Colonel George Mason stands to address the men assembled. Remember, it's two days before the end of convention. They've been there for months. They're tired. It's hot. They're ready to go home. And he stands and addresses the assembly, and he says, we have a fundamental problem with the document we've drafted. We've given the power to the federal government to propose amendments should they deem them necessary, but we failed to give that same power to the people acting through their state legislatures. And then he asks a question, which to me resonates over two centuries later. He asks, are we so naive that we believe that a federal government that becomes a tyranny will propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? I wish we had video. You guys laughed. I bet you they laughed, right? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Nobody restrains their own tyranny. We have no examples of human, in human history of a government restraining its own tyranny. 
So he proposes this idea that we ought to give state legislatures the power to call a convention of states to propose amendments specifically to restrain the federal government. You know what the men assembled did? It's an amazing thing because it's really unusual. Madison's notes have these words in it, nin com, which means no comment in Latin. There's no debate. There is no debate. Men who debated everything, who debated what kind of prayer should be said at the meeting, whether they should have a prayer, could they, could they pay a preacher to come? They debated everything. They didn't debate this. And in fact, it was unanimously adopted, one of the few things in the Constitution to give us the power to do this.